text is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a new student, Stefan, talking to an assistant, Anna, at the student union about his membership. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Hi, can I help you? Um, yeah, I hope so. Um, this is the first time I've been down to the Union. I'm a new international student and I just wondered what to do. Oh, right. Well, normally we ask international students to fill out this form and we put your details on the wall by reception. Then other students can contact you. It's a way for everybody to get to know each other. It can be a bit lonely otherwise. <laughs> oh, I see. What's your name? I'm Anna, by the way. It's Stefan Unger. OK. Well, just write that there next to name uh -huh. and then fill in the rest. All right. Um, what does it mean, degree programme? Oh, uh, just if you are an undergraduate or a postgraduate. Or maybe you're just here for a short course? I'm a postgraduate. Oh. Uh, do I need to say what in? Not really. It's too much detail. But you should put your department so people who have the same interests or problems as you can get in touch. So I'm studying marine construction, so... For department, do I put down the science faculty then? Uh, just your actual department. That must be engineering, no? Oh, I see, yes. Then if you list what you like doing in your free time, not that we ever get any when we're studying, <laughs> and maybe you can meet up with someone socially or to join a club or something. Well, I like lots of things. Shall I just list them? Um, my advice is to just put one or two, like football and films or whatever. Otherwise, you'll get so many invitations, you won't get any time to work. OK. I think I'll just list computer games, as that's my big interest. Oh. I haven't played football for ages. <laughs> I may start to play once I get settled. Now, let's see. Next thing is languages. Yes. We find many of the international students get a bit tired of speaking English all the time. Sometimes they like to speak to someone in their own language. It's up to you. That is a good idea. I presume I don't need to put English down. Oh, no. <laughs> I put um, Italian and French. <clears throat> I can only speak German, my mother tongue. OK, well, that's fine. Just put that. Uh... What does accommodation mean? Is that my address? We're trying to find similarities between people and some people live in hall, some are in flats, some are in bedsits. So it helps if you say. I'm in hall, though I'd like to be in a flat, but that won't happen till the end of the first term. Put where you are now. You can always change it later. Uh, then finally, just put your phone number. I haven't really got one. I haven't sorted out a mobile yet. Well, it's going to be difficult for people to contact you then, isn't it? Mm. Why don't you put the union one and we'll take messages for you. OK. It's 02950659003. Have you got that? Uh. Yes. OK, then. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10.
Oh, I had a couple more questions about the services you've got here. Um, it says there's a photocopier here. Yes. You need to get a card from the shop, and then it's available to all students in the mornings. The union uses it after 1 pm. Okay. I see also the union organizes loads of events. Are they always held here in the union building? It looks big enough. <laughs> If you're interested in something, you should check the poster or our website. In fact, we normally use the round theatre, opposite the conference centre, for most events, because the sound system is better. Right, I'll do that. Also, I wanted to hire a van. Can I do that through you? Um, no. You need to present a case, really.、Oh. They're not just available for hire to anyone.、Mm. The president said we have to limit who is allowed to hire them. The person you need to see is the transport secretary. She's on the second floor. Okay, thanks. The other thing is, are all the discounts we get with our union card listed on the back of the card? I thought there might be more. No, that's it, I'm afraid. Mainly books, clothes, and music. Though we are currently negotiating to get one on newspapers, so that should be valid from next term. Okay. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk on local radio about a short film festival in the town of Adborn. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Today we're pleased to have on the show Fatima Johnson, who is the organizer of the Adborn Film Festival. Welcome, Fatima. Hello. Can you tell us a bit about the background to the festival and what it brings to the town? Well, the festival was started in 1996 by the then mayor of Adborn, Joanne Smith. She wasn't a filmmaker herself. She'd actually been a very energetic tourism development officer for many years, but Adborn had run a classical music festival, which had been becoming less and less popular in recent years. Joanne was looking around for something to replace it, and to use funds allocated to it to promote something which local people can enjoy. <laughs> Great. So tell us about the festival nowadays. Well, it's held in the last two weeks of August every year, and short films from all over the world are shown in three places:、uh, in the theatre and our two cinemas. Several films are shown in one performance, and the whole thing lasts about ninety minutes. Tickets are very reasonably priced. Under twelves used to get in for fifty p, but now we charge just one pound, which is still very good value. One pound fifty for students and two pounds fifty for everyone else. Performances are advertised all round town and also on our website, www. adbornfest. com. If you're interested in attending any performance, you can buy tickets online, of course. And you can also get them in the library, which is right next to the main shopping area. I'm afraid this year tickets are no longer available from either of the two cinemas because of restricted opening times.、Oh. 
I understand you also run a film competition? Yes, for under-18s. We have a different theme every year. Last year, for example, the theme was Future Planet, and the winner was a ten-minute documentary encouraging youngsters to be more aware of environmental issues, focusing on getting school kids to cycle to school instead of going by car. This year, the theme is Sporting Nation, so... There'll also be lots of ideas to choose from. Now, we're always on the lookout for new local talent, so if you live in the Adborn area and are under 18, you should have a go. We have an excellent prize every year donated by local businesses, shops, hotels, etc. This year, you can win a high-spec movie camera worth over £800. Application forms are on the website... And the deadline for sending in your film to enter the competition is the last day of July. It's May now, so you'll have the whole of June to be working on it. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. And what are the judges looking for? Well, although we choose very topical issues like the environment, we're not looking for propaganda, you know, trying to get people to do something. <laughs> Instead, we're looking for a new angle, a fresh way of looking at a theme. And of course, because it's a short film festival, it's not really about a fully worked story with well-rounded characters. It's more about good photography, conveying things visually. Mm. And who judges the films? A panel of three people who know a lot about film. We've used the same judges for many years and we're very happy with their expertise. One thing we probably will change next year, though, is we want to add another class and another prize for older filmmakers. We'll keep it at a maximum of ten minutes, though. The length works well for our festival. We also want to use different venues for the film shows, such as community centres and at least one school. It might make performances more accessible to a wider audience. We did explore the possibility of having late-night showings, but that's unlikely to happen in the coming year. So, as I say, if anyone's interested in submitting a film for our competition, go on to our website and you'll be able to access everything... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. 
I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? a y Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at. Uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y- yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, a y I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but you're spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. OK, a y I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Mm. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. (laughs) For example, this bit. um, The statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Ah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? Exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. (laughs) I I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... uh, I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, It's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. (laughs) (laughs) Just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. (laughs) Right, OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a series of lectures on the survival of our planet. Professor Samson talks about endangered species of flora and fauna. First, you'll have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic in this series of lectures on our planet is about ensuring the survival of our very important plant and animal species. In this lecture, I want to discuss one way that we can do this. No one will ever see a huge dinosaur thundering through the forest. No one will ever see a paradise parrot flash its rainbow colours across the sky. The fact is that many animals and plants have been wiped out. Sadly, they are extinct. It is too late for them. Extinction is forever. We can't do anything about the species that have already disappeared. But today, there are many animals and plants that could still become extinct in the future if we do not act now. They are endangered. The African elephant and rhinoceros have become endangered because of the value of their tusks. Australian parrots and reptiles are smuggled onto planes because certain people in other countries are prepared to pay thousands of dollars for them. And there are many other species around the world that are endangered because they no longer have a place in which to live and reproduce safely. The main cause of extinction is the destruction of habitats. A habitat contains all that a living thing needs to survive. Space, light, water, food, shelter, and opportunities for reproduction. The population of the world is growing rapidly, and this is placing great demands on land and resources for housing and for growing food. When vegetation is cleared and swamps are drained for agriculture, mining, and suburbs, or when rivers are dammed to store water, Plants are destroyed and animal life is threatened. In other words, humans are changing and destroying the habitats of animals and plants, which is in turn reducing their chances of survival. So how can we conserve habitats and help save endangered species? Well, one way is to protect their habitats permanently in national parks or nature reserves. National parks have been created in many countries. They encourage people to enjoy the beauty and diversity of the animals and plants that live there without harming them. By supporting and visiting these parks, people can become more aware of the species that live there and how the parks work to protect them. It is very important that, when visiting a national park, we keep them safe for future generations of plants and animals by obeying a few rules. Firstly, follow the fire regulations. Don't throw cigarettes or build fires, except at certain times of the year in especially allocated areas and facilities. Secondly, remember to leave pets at home. Pets, such as cats or dogs, can hunt birds or other small animals. Some pets might even escape and become a serious threat. Thirdly, place all rubbish in a bin or take it home. Plastic bags or leftover food are dangerous to the animals and harm the environment. Don't pick the flowers or damage the plants. Flowers create the next generation of the plant. Also, for the same reason, birds' eggs must be left in their nests. The loss of species in the past is sad. However, there is hope for the future. Despite the demands of our increasing population, we can work to protect the plant and animal species we still have. So I would like to conclude by saying that I believe that, with strong public awareness and support of these national parks and reserves, the future of endangered species can be ensured. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.